this morning. Amen. Amen. There's a song we're going to sing today, a chorus that should not be forgotten. And I think, I don't know, maybe some, I don't know if anybody knows this one here, but we sang it as kids. <laughs> so it's an oldie. But, <laughs> but I, I think we need to keep it going. I like the, some of these choruses and tend to die along the way and they get forgotten and I don't want this one to get forgotten. It goes this way. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I see brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. I, you have to stand to sing that one, I think. Let's all stand together and sing it. You're singing well today. I've got to say that. You're singing real well for a song I don't think you knew, did you? You're doing all right. Let's do it again. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt. I could never pay. Aren't you thankful for that? He paid your debt. <laughs> he paid it. Oh, let's sing it one more time. He paid a debt. <clears throat> he did not owe. I owed a debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. You may be seated. To Babylon! what I saw and what it means. Take me to the king. Out of the gods. Out of Babylon. Bow to me. What do I do? Here is the prisoner. He is a traitor of Babylon and an enemy of the king. What do you see?
that's a Christian sort of production uh, group in, um, in Lancaster. And they put on these monumental Christian uh, musical and theatrical biblical stories. And uh, Faith and I just went recently to see Daniel. And it's just an absolutely unimaginably professionally moving done type of a presentation. Beams know about it. They know about sight and sound. But it is coming to, uh, to Tinseltown in Erie at the theaters. And so I encourage you to be, maybe if you uh, have that, those couple of nights uh, open to go see that. I mean, you pay, you know, by the time you drive out there, buy tickets at Lancaster, stay overnight and come back, it's three or four hundred bucks. But just the price of a theater ticket and you'll get to see on the screen in front of you just this wonderful Christ-honoring, gospel-focused, um, very, very, very moving story of Daniel. It's just absolutely terrific. So I'd encourage you to, to uh, consider uh, being a part of that. So Faith is not here today. She and Jonathan, I want to just report, they landed in Bangkok safely and uh, on a medical missions trip, and um, they're doing well. They went to church early in the morning, 12 hours ago. So, uh, so they said, tell everybody hello. And yes... I did feed and dress myself this morning. <laughs> I already asked that question. Thank you. So, good to see uh, each and every one of you today. We love you. So glad uh, you could join us together as the family of God comes together today. A couple of things apart from that Daniel announcement at Tinseltown in Erie. Um, and this, this is not in your bulletin, but we will be having a... Embers meeting on August the 12th, uh, Monday, August the 12th, so please put that, make sure that's in your, uh, your date book, in your calendar there. And uh, just also, August the 25th, if you hadn't circled that, I encourage you to circle that date, just kind of call that holy, and that's going to be our church picnic after the service uh, on, on that Sunday, and at our next business meeting, we'll talk about uh, some of the plans for that and what everybody can do to help us prepare for that. So that's coming up on uh, August the 25th. So some, uh, we've sort of slacked off now. A lot of things are behind us. The bike clinic is behind us and things like that. So we have a little bit more time to sort of catch our breath. Is that on? Is that on? Yeah, that's on. I thought my mic went dead because I hit the button. So I'd like to invite you to stand with me when we unite our hearts in prayer. I did want to read a wonderful passage of scripture this morning uh, for us to uh, be aware of. So go ahead and stand and as we read God's word and we'll enter in prayer together. Uh, Philippians 4 verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. For the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is anything excellent, and if there is anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. And how important it is when we come in to the church family to have our mind focused properly as we gather with the congregation of saints and begin to lift our corporate worship to the Lord together. So let's enter in prayer together with me, if you would. Holy Father, we come in the name of Jesus today, Lord, and we're thankful for all the ways that you've shown yourself faithful to us this week, um, all the ways that you gave us grace in challenging situations and circumstances this week, all the ways that you used us, you used our influence this week, to somehow re 
reach into another person's life mm -hmm. and point them to Christ. Mm -hmm. And we're thankful that you use us like that, Lord. Mm -hmm. We pray today as we gather together, Lord, and lift up our praises. We pray your Holy Spirit would be free to work and to move and stir up all the praise that's within every single heart here today so that our praise would rise to you as a sweet offering today, Lord. We ask you for that. We ask that Jesus Christ be rightfully exalted in our thoughts, in our words, in our worship, in our prayer, in our lessons, in our fellowship today. So, Lord, we thank you. Move among us in each and every heart today, Lord, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray today. Amen. If you'd like to go, uh, sing it with the hymn book, it's on page 170. We're going to sing a song that tells the whole story of the gospel. I love this song. One day, one day, start for verses 2 and 3, we're going to sing together without the, without the uh, refrain. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he.
One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, my Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me.
thank you so much for that. We appreciate that offer, Tori. Thank you so much. Before we go to our prayer time, uh, we'd like to uh, uh, share a little praise time. So if you have a reason to praise the Lord today, you'd like to share with the church family, uh, we'd like to hear about that. Uh, it's good to see uh, Heidi here today, and her tribe is in tow, all but Matt. And uh, Matt's not here, but uh, he was dedicated to something in his church today and had responsibilities, and uh, that's where he is. He's serving the Lord at his church. But good to see you. Good to see you guys and your family uh, today. Um, so if you have a, a word of praise today, uh, please raise your hand, and we'd love to hear what God is doing. My uh, father died uh, a couple of months ago uh, on uh, Easter morning, in fact, uh, and it got me thinking about uh, our family's uh, faith history. Uh, my mother uh, grew up in a conservative uh, church just like this one and uh, became a believer at a young age, but my father had no interest in church. His family had never gone to church, and we uh, never went to church. Uh, and uh, I have two brothers that are both very close to me in age, just a couple of years younger. And my parents had uh, a concern that, uh, well, the Wilsons might have had, how do you keep three rambunctious boys uh, close in age out of trouble? <laughs> uh, of course, they made a study. There was no such thing as a C on a report card in our house. Uh, but beyond that, they kept us on our feet and kept us moving. And we, uh, oh, endlessly hiked, uh, swam, fished, canoed, sailed, even kicked a soccer ball around years ago before it was uh, popular. Uh, but our main things were uh, playing two-on-two -two basketball with the four of us. My father played also. And I have many uh, pleasant memories of that. And also uh, uh, many pleasant memories of... Uh, shoveling uh, the pond off around the corner and playing hockey on it. Uh, and as, as time went on, God was uh, gracious, and uh, along the way, uh, my, myself, my two brothers, and my father all accepted Christ and became believers. Yeah, so, uh, the great thing. Uh, but it's what it's brought to mind, and, and I'm sure a concern that uh, many of you have also, that we'll get to see our relatives in the next life on the new earth and uh, something we all look forward to I'm sure but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to uh, maybe play a little two-on-two -two basketball you know if they play basketball in the new earth but I'm hopeful and if uh, if uh, there's any snow and ice uh, we may be able to shovel off a pond and play hockey you never know so uh, God's been good to uh, take all of us into his family Thank you. Um, praise the Lord for those memories like that. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Anyone else have a have a word of praise that you'd like to share to, with the church family today? Bev? Well, I think I have said it before. But Jody is totally back to work, Great. and uh, all her issues with the cancer are starting to subside. And she's got ambition like you wouldn't believe, and I don't know where she's getting it from. Yes, we do. <laughs> she's getting it from the Lord, and uh, he's really given her the strength to complete things before winter. And... Uh, she actually came out and said, Mom, I really praise God for what he's gotten me through. And I just praise for that. Amen. Thank you, Bev. Absolutely, boy. That is an answer to prayer. Uh, any others? While I'm on this side of it. Darren? Yeah, Wilma's nephew has been sick and his wife has had a stroke and they can't get out 
So they called and wanted to know if we could help them out. We said, certainly. So we went shopping for them, and we was carrying the stuff into the house with steps that are pretty risky in front. And we had this big case of bottled water, and it's pretty heavy. And a young man come walking by uh, leading a dog. And he says, can I help you folks? And I said, yes, come. And he tied the dog up, come over and finished <laughs> loading up the stuff in the house, which the Lord provides. Wow. Absolutely, wow. Thank you. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Daryl. Something as simple as taking water into a house, Lord, Lord, Lord saw that as a need. Uh, any others? Any others? some prayer. Just checking that's all again. Let's go. What a privilege we have to bring our needs before the Lord in prayer. We have some very special requests to bring before you today. Jeremiah Ridout uh, has a very special need. He has colon cancer and now he's in ICU because it has gone septic. Uh, he is um, Casey, Cassie Shell's brother. So we want to remember that need in prayer today. Also, um, we keep remembering those on our list in prayer that are, are looking this way for prayer and we're trusting God to work. Thank the Lord for that good report on Jody. We're grateful to hear that. God is answering prayer there, and we're thankful that she's acknowledging God. That's great. Praise the Lord. And we want to keep remembering those that have had losses. We think of the Lemansky family. Tony went to be with the Lord after a long battle with cancer. He's, he went to be with the Lord. What a funeral service. What a time of rejoicing. You know, that's, that's unique about Christian funerals. We can weep, and we can miss the one that's going, but we can rejoice too, because we know where they are. And out of their suffering, thanks be to God. We want to continue to remember these needs. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, believing God to answer today. Precious Lord, we want to first of all bring before you this Jeremiah writout. You see this situation with colon cancer and now septic and in ICU. I'm glad there's no distance in prayer. He's in Texas and we're here. But there's no distance in prayer. As we come before the throne of God through Jesus, that all-powerful name, we have the assurance that you hear us. And Lord, you can touch and minister to, Jer to this need today. Touch Jeremiah. Minister to this need, we pray. And we'll thank you. We want to remember uh, Jody in prayer. And we want to thank you for what you're doing in her life. And pray that you'll continue to work, Lord. We're believing that this cancer will have no effect on her whatsoever. She's going to be cleared of it completely. Thank you, Lord, for working in her life. And we'll give you praise. Thank you for working spiritually while working physically. And we'll certainly continue to give you the praise and the honor and glory for all that you're doing. And we want to remember Crystal Hemlock in prayer, now being admitted to Cleveland Clinic. Lord, you know, and we just pray that you'll guide the doctors, give them wisdom and direction, and help them to be able to find the cause of what's happening in her body. Thank you, Lord. Be with the families of those who have lost loved ones. We think of the Neelan family and all the many loved ones that are connected with the Neelans. Pray, Lord, that you would minister and be their comfort and be their strength. Be, Lord, with Tony's family. We're thankful, Lord, for the testimony that he left. He had a strong testimony. And we thank you, Lord. Now would you bring the comfort to this family, especially we pray for his mother. Would you surround her with your comfort? And Lord, also all of the members of that church, that they will just be strengthened in you today. Lord, we so believe you to work. 
and we're going to thank you. Continue to minister to Glenn. You know the situation. You know the back problem that he's dealing with. And then, Lord, you also know the situation with his brother and sister-in-law. They really need to be in a full-time, long-term care situation. Would you work out the details? You know, Lord, just all about it. And you understand, Lord, every situation better than we do. So, Lord, we're not telling you how to do it. We're just turning it over to you and committing it to you. And thanking you, Lord, for working. Be with Jonathan and Faith, we pray. Minister in a very special way to them as they begin their ministry, I assume, tomorrow. Oh God, would you just anoint them, bless them, use them for your honor and glory as they minister to the medical needs of the people they'll be in contact with. May these people see Jesus in them. And Lord, even though there's a language barrier, you can work and we're thankful. Be with our camps, all of these camps that are going on right now, whether here in America or uh, in Romania or wherever, Lord, Hungary, you know. Oh God, just minister and work in a very special way. And may there be a harvest of precious souls coming into the kingdom of God. Lord, we're thankful for the, the testimony this morning that we have the joy of thinking about the fact that we're going to see our loved ones that want to be with you. We're going to see them again. As was mentioned in this testimony, not sure what we'll be doing all the time in heaven, but Lord, we're thankful, so very thankful to know that we have the joy of knowing we can gather around the throne of God and worship and praise you and give you all the glory. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be. And we thank you, Lord, that we have that blessed hope. Oh, God, even so come, Lord Jesus. Minister to every need here today, we pray. Be our strength, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to 542 in our hymn book and sing, When We All Get to Heaven, What a Day of Rejoicing That Will Be. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day. Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Verse 3 Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward, Christ before us soon, his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of
Go to children's church. We're not having children's church today. We are or we're not? Okay, Becky is, is that right? Okay, the little ones, little learners. Okay, okay, gotcha, I'm sorry, okay. children's church there were some disappointing expressions out there just to let you know so sorry about that but glad you're missing it no not glad you're missing it that didn't come out right glad you would like to have gone anyway so today we are on two questions of great questions to God and uh, solid answers from the Bible and again, I combine sort of two questions and what we'll be dealing with today. We'll address both of those questions, hopefully. Uh, question number 13 was, how do I approach a family member if they don't accept my true identity in Christ? So there is a believer in a family that are not believers, and there is some strife there. How do I approach a family member if they don't accept my true identity in Christ? Together with this question, question number 21, how do I talk to someone who has stated that they have conflicting opinions about religion? So we're going to be looking at both of those. But our first answer is going to be ask, uh, ask God first. Ask God first. Ask God first. Ask God first. And now I'm turning my phone off. It was ringing out a bit. That you all can do the same. So, um, Ted, uh, Ted told me he likes steaks, and he likes. How do you like your steak prepared, Ted? Medium well. Medium well. You like some of that good seasoning on it and everything. Sure. Little A one sauce or Heinz fifty seven on the side. Uh, all right, a lot of juice, a lot of flavor. Okay, Ted. Ted, I got I got your steak here. Oh, thank you. You got a funny look on your face. I think it's a mistake. A mistake? <laughs> but I prepared it just like I knew you liked it. You're not. This is not good enough for you. Oh, that's good. Is it oh, that's something good. about curb appeal? Not. I thank you for it. Do you? Yeah. Ted likes steak. But what's wrong with this picture? The presentation stinks. Exactly right. The presentation stinks. It's got a garbage. Oh, there was a worm there. I didn't even see it after just now. Added protein. Apart from the gospel message itself, presentation, presentation is of utmost importance. And that's kind of what we're dealing with today. The background of how we present our faith, how we present the gospel, how we deal with others in our family or maybe at work. Um, with our dealing with our faith, trying to communicate our faith to them when they don't really accept it. So apart from the gospel message itself, the presentation is of utmost importance. So when it comes to doing what God has called us to do, sharing our faith, teaching the gospel, urging others to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, our witness is as important as our words. How we say what we say is just about as important as what we say. Does that make sense? How we say what we say is just about as important as what we say. Presentation. How we say what we say is the presentation and affects the receptivity for others as it will affect their view and their openness to what we're trying to share with them. 
just like a nice steak. Who wouldn't like a nice steak cooked just to perfection, but the presentation was repulsive, especially with that extra worm mixed to it. <laughs> and we can have the, 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 the beauty of the gospel message, and we can practice it, we can memorize it, have all the verses memorized, but our presentation, if it's not loving, if it's not kind, if it's not respectful, uh, it can become repulsive to people. So if we offend people by the manner in which we share our faith or tell others about the Bible or about Jesus, we just may be the reason that people reject Christ more than the content of the gospel itself. It is one thing if people are rejecting the gospel. It is something else if they reject the gospel because of how it's presented, unloving, unkind, disrespectful. And when you are sharing the gospel or sharing your faith with someone, especially if they've heard it all before, how many times are they going to talk to me about this? We have to realize that quite likely, wading through much earlier harsh Bible thumpers so that what you're attempting to communicate is being filtered through their colored lenses of past unpleasant experiences. Does that make sense? I had a fellow at work, I already told you about his story. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but it was about an answer to prayer that he and I, I prayed for him in two days. God answered that prayer specifically. But he always told me, Jeff, don't say anything about your religion. About the first few days we met, I slept and said something about my religion. He said, that, that was hammered in my head. That was forced down my throat. Don't ever talk to me about your religion. Little by little, that kind of eased up. But it was his background. He, he, did, he didn't just hate Jesus. It wasn't about that. He didn't just hate the Bible. He just hated the way he'd been treated. Which was him, for him, was what religion was all about. That's all he knew about religions, how he'd been treated by religious people. So to your friend or family members, you may be just one more crazy religious person trying to indoctrinate everyone else with your own beliefs. And I would say this is, this is often the case. I think we like to have statistics. There's something about Christians. We like the statistic that says these people are walking away from God. These people are turning their back on the faith. These people are, well, you know, not always. And I found more and more people in my experience, this is not an authorized survey, but from my experience, most of the people who I speak with who are opposed to hearing the gospel is because they are opposed to hearing it because of how in their background, from their unpleasant experiences, it was either knocked on the head with it or it was forced down their throat. From their perspective. Not that the people did it wrong, but from their perspective. So I would say that's often the case with people. I don't, think, I don't think people are rejecting Christ as much as we think they are. In fact, I believe we are living in days of great days of mercy. When God is at work, if we just look and see what he's doing and not accept all these gloom and doom of, 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 of Christianity leaving America. It, it, it may be, but it's certainly not as bad, I think, as we think it is. So when we're thinking about the challenge of discussing and talking to others, especially those closest to us, about the good news of Jesus and about our faith, a few points, that's a challenge for us. That's the challenge that we're discussing. And I would encourage you to consider that challenge. Consider the challenge relationally. Consider the challenge from a relational perspective, okay? Consider this challenge of sharing your faith with others from a relational perspective. People often view their situations through the relationship, previous negative relationship experiences. So we're going to practice the golden rule. Practice the golden rule. Have you written that down yet? Practice the golden rule. Here are some steps to help us things that we're going to practice to hopefully be more alert and in tune to uh, the people that we're trying to share our faith with, talk to Jesus about when they have had bad experiences and for whatever reason, they're kind of they're kind of opposition, opposing, I guess, what we have to tell them, at least at first. 
practice the golden rule. Who can tell me what the golden rule is? You want to others, and you let them do unto you. Yeah, Matthew 7, verse 12. So whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them. And this is the law and the prophets. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. Practice the golden rule. We, we quote that as kids. I don't know if we ever put it into practice as adults, to be quite honest with you. I wonder. It's one of the greatest principles of relationship ever, ever quoted. And yet we almost never think about that. Well, what, I, what should I do in this situation? Practice the golden rule. How should I care? How should I listen and treat my spouse? Practice the golden rule. How should I listen to my friend at Home Depot? Practice the golden rule. Treat others the way you would want to be treated yourself. Not, not so that they will treat you that way. That it's, it doesn't say treat people this way so that they will treat you in like manner. It doesn't say that. It doesn't promise that. But treat others the way you would want to be treated. It's just a common sense, sort of a self-focused way of knowing how to best relate to other people. I'm really angry at you right now, Larry. I'm really angry at Larry. Oh, so how, how, how should I treat Larry? How would I want Larry to treat me? Well, then I guess I better keep my disrespect to myself and treat Larry with kindness. See, if we did that, what a difference our relationships would make. So we don't, it's not given to us so that someone will treat us like, like we're forcing them. They'll be obligated to treat us in like manner. Nor is it because it's a guarantee that you will more likely win the argument if you do. Oh, I would, I'd be willing to do that if I could win the argument. But it's, that's not the purpose. Neither one of those is the purpose. The purpose is because it is how God has commanded us, number one, and instructed us to treat others in our relationships to honor him and well, as well as to honor others. Just simply God said so, number one. But number two, he gives us a reason because that's going to be a, a way that we can judge how our relationships can be better because I'm treating you the way I would like you to treat me. I think... If, if people committed in their hearts to live by the golden rule today, tomorrow morning we'd all wake up in a different world wondering, where, are, where am I? This is a bizarre old world because it would make that much of a difference. Wars would be gone. Strife would be over with for the most part because I'm treating others the way I would want to be treated. Treat others the way you would want them to treat you. With this as a guide, we are more likely to be more considerate, more respectful, as we discuss with others things that we presently disagree on, especially in the areas of religion. So I want to read to you 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. And this time I'm not focusing on chapter, verse 15, but verse 16. But we're going to read verses 12 to 16. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who are evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy." Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's been our previous focus. But verse 16, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Verse 16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ would be shamed, would be put to shame. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile you 
revile your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed. Treating others honorably, and what does it do? Number one, it, it, it frees you. You have a good conscience between you and God. Somebody abuses you verbally or whatever's going on, uh, and you're offended, rather than treating them the way they just treated you, you use the practice the what? Practice the golden rule. Practice the God. So I'm not going to treat him the way he treated me, but I'm going to treat him the way I wish he would treat me. So your conscience is clear before God. God, I did it. It's in your hands now. You know. I did what you told me to do. I, I, I said it with love in my heart, kindness in my voice, my words. I feel like your Holy Spirit guided me in that because that wasn't what I was thinking. But... But I, I believe I practiced the golden rule. So our, our conscience is clear before God. I didn't goof things up. But also your conscience is clear before the people you're disagreeing with. Somebody lambasts you and you treat them with kindness. And they start cursing you. They start oppressing you. And you're like, all I did was give. No, no, you were, you were mean to me. No, I was just trying to be kind for you. No, no, you were mean to me. Pretty soon those around him were saying, you know what? I believe this guy's right. He treated you with quite a bit of kindness. You were kind of a jack wagon over there. And he treated you with kindness. And you still continue to go off on the guy. Hey, maybe he's got something. So your conscience is clear before yourself and God and clear between you and the people who are slandering you. People will see that person has no reason to be mad at him or her because that Christian was treating him or her with utmost respect and he didn't deserve it. How we relate to others, how we treat others, how we respond when we disagree will affect the receptivity of others towards our presentation of Christ and the gospel message. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 says this, Walk in wisdom towards others. Consider making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be giving them a piece of your mind. Let your speech always, you mean even when they're cursing me and, 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 and oppressing me, let your speech always be gracious and seasoned, seasoned with salt. How many of you like salt? How many of you like for people to be gracious when you disagree with something? Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Making the best. Not just talking about brothers and sisters in the Lord, but people you're going to be disagreeing with, people you're going to be sharing the gospel with, people who have, up to you, up to your experience with you, have had negative, uh, difficult experiences with religious people. So when you're Talking to outsiders, make the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer the other person. The level of your relationship with a person will affect the level of receptivity to what you have to say. The level of your relationship with another person will affect the level of receptivity they'll have to hear what you have to say. If they don't know who you are, they may not listen to you. If you want to stop and you stop somebody downtown Chicago and say, hey, can I share the gospel with you? They'll say no, and they'll just keep going. But if you stop, say, hey, Bill, how are you doing? Let me share what the Lord did to my life this week. He's liable to listen to you because he knows you. But if he knows that oh, last time I spoke to Jeff, all he did was you know, back me in a corner. Boy, he called me kind of names. I felt kind of, you know, he's going to say, oh, no, no, not right now, not right now. So the level of our relationship with a person will affect the level of receptivity that they will have to whatever it is that we think we have to say to them. Does that make sense? People are more like, likely to listen to you if they know you they're more likely to listen to you if they know you and know that you have had a kind, respectful, 
conversation with them before, even it was if it was over something that you disagreed. Sometimes the biggest battle is not in the argument, but in fighting with one ourselves, within ourselves, to retain our own beliefs and our own values. When disagreeing with others regarding the faith, consider this challenge. Consider the theological aspects of it, the biblical aspects of it. When disagreeing with others, consider this, this challenge theologically. How, how, how am I going to affect, uh, address this disagreement theologically, from a theological perspective? So here's what we're going to practice. The other one was practice the golden rule. This one is in, in terms of the theological aspect of it. Practice tolerance, not compromise. Practice tolerance, not compromise. Tolerance is something. Okay, here goes Jeff again. He's going off on the gospel. Okay, we'll listen to him. We'll respect him. We'll, we'll, we'll tolerate him. Or not compromise. You can tolerate somebody and disagree with them, or you can compromise and say, okay, yeah, forget what I, forget my beliefs. Yeah, our, our friendship is, is worth more than that, so forget about that. Forget about what I was trying to tell you. Practice tolerance. Don't practice compromise. Sometimes the greatest challenge is not winning the argument, but keeping our biblical focus together. Retain your biblical standards and values and engage in activities that go along with God's word and, viola and does not violate your convictions. A lot of people, when it comes to a lot of adults with grandchildren, and maybe the grandchildren start waving the rainbow flag. And we all know what that means, the LGBT thing. And they grew up being knowing that that was... That was sin in the Bible, but now the granddaughter is LGBT or the grandson is LGBT, and I don't want to offend them, so now before long we see grandma and grandpa have the LGBT filter over their own Facebook page, like I support the LGBT. What happened to the, the theology that you grew up with? What happened to the biblical values that you were growing up with, that you were teaching people? And sometimes we just don't know as Christians how to have a meaningful relationship with somebody that we disagree with theologically, unfortunately. Practice tolerance, but not compromise. Retain your biblical convictions. I always think it's kind of odd, and, and even do things with the people. I think it's kind of odd at work. They'll say, hey, uh, let's go out, let's go to the bar after work and, and have some, you know, have some, you know, and, and go drinking. And I don't think a beer is a sin. I don't think that at all. The Bible doesn't teach that. But I don't drink. I don't drink alcoholic beverages. I don't drink any of it. But I said, well, you know what? Uh, I'd rather not drink a beer, but I'd be glad to go to McDonald's and buy you a Tennessee sweet tea. And they look at you like, what planet did you just arrive from? <laughs> like, like, we can't have a meaningful friendship unless we're drinking and getting buzzed. You know what? We can go to McDonald's, get a Tennessee iced tea, free refills, and we'll be able to walk out. And remember the conversation. Remember the friendships that we had. But somehow they don't do that. The world doesn't look at it like that. Well, if you're not going to go out drinking, then you're not a friend of mine. But I had people ask me that. And I said, well, you know, if we're friends, let's just go, let's get tea. Or let's get coffee. I'd still want to be your friend. I still, we still can be friends. But it's just never worked out that way. Not once with me. Maybe it's the sweet tea, I don't know. Be willing to do things with people, even you disagree with, to show that you care, to show that the relationship is important, especially if it's a family member. The third thing is practically. Face the challenge practically. Practically, I'm focusing on listening to another viewpoint of a person that you disagree with. 
Practice listening. There's the practice. Practice listening rather than arguing. Practice listening rather than arguing. You know, when we disagree on something, the first thing we do is try to straighten somebody out. Isn't that right? Don't tell me it's not. Well, you're wrong. I got, I got to make you right before you get out of this conversation. I can't let you leave until you bow, bow your knee to, to, my, to, to what I'm embracing. And if I were to ask you, what is that person exactly embracing? You would probably have to say, I'm not real sure, but I know I'm against it. You know, people think Christians, they think more about people who fight against things, oppose things, than people who really have a positive aspect. I think it's positive. If you say, no, I, I don't think I agree with where you're coming from, but let's let, tell me more. Tell me more. That would, that would be a, a, a novel idea if somebody you really vehemently disagreed with, and they knew it, but you were saying, I want to know more where about you're coming from. I want to understand this a little better. A lot of times we start arguing and we're not even arguing about what they believe. Because we don't listen. We listen to win an argument. We don't listen to learn about what's going on in the other person or why they got to where they are in that particular topic or those particular convictions. Listen to the viewpoint of others before expressing disagreement. Learn to listen. Learn to listen to their story. Learn to listen to their experiences with the purpose of understanding where they came from. You know, I found like I have found that the people that I disagree with most tend to break my heart the most when I figure out and understand what they've been through. It doesn't make what they necessarily believe right, but it helps us to understand where they're coming from. And I think that is crucial. If you're wanting a relationship, if you're wanting someone to listen to you, then you and I need to be willing to listen to them. Isn't that just fair? Isn't that fair? If we're not willing to listen to them, we shouldn't be surprised if they're not willing to listen to us. Practicing the golden rule again. Acts chapter 17 is Paul in the Areopagus, and this is where he addresses the, the uh, idols of the unknown God. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. So Paul is, is, is in this um, context of all of these idols, just all idols, Idols to every God except the true and the living God. Just idols, idols, false gods galore. And he says, he doesn't come out swinging. He, he, just, he, he doesn't come out saying, you're a bunch of idolaters. You're all going to hell in a handbasket. You're sinning, you're sinning, you're sinning. Let me tell you about your sin and your idolatry and your idolatry. And God hates you. God hates this and that. You know, trying to win win people to your side, I don't, I don't think it's going to be very effective. But Paul says, "Hey, I, I perceive you're very religious people. What what a place to start in the in the conversation. Hey, you're you're religious. Hey, that's that's admirable. You know, I think that's admirable to have that spirit to have spiritual be spiritually minded. So he says, I perceive that in every way you are very religious." For I, as I passed along and observed all your objects of worship, I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown to you, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men. In other words, here are all these idols, all these shrines. There's a shrine less than a mile from Sagertown on the, on the highway down there. All of these shrines, all of these little structures where there's a <laughs> god carved and, and put in there. So he's all these, um, all of these idols are all unknown to you, but I proclaim to you who the god of the unknown god is. 
The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples by man, made by men like all these other idols do, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything else. Verse 32. It goes on to say, And when he had finished, some mocked, but others said, We'd like to hear more about this. Let's make another appointment. We'll meet with you again on this matter, they said. So there were some that mocked them. So what? We all get that. You know, we're going to have to grow up. They were mocking some, but others, and we don't know what the, you know, what the division was or the percentage, but some said, you know what? We want to hear more. And we will always have that, people. We will always have some people who just reject everything we, we say, others that might be more receptive to what we have, and then there's others that will just be listening, kind of doing their thing, and we don't know that they're listening. But they're, they look like they're distracted, like they're not even listening. They're not arguing, they're not agreeing, but they're just doing nothing. So it looks. Listening to other people. And Paul respectfully addressed these people, and some mocked. It doesn't say they never believed, it just says some mocked. Others said, We will hear you again in this manner. They weren't won over at that point, but they were receptive. Don't be deceived into thinking that we always have to get others to agree with us. If they are receptive, then they will think about it and they will possibly, eventually, consider it. Do we see the value in that? There's not always a value in winning the argument. There is value in helping other people be receptive so that we can help them as the Holy Spirit begins working in their heart and opening their hearts, that we will begin to, 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 to teach and to help them understand, maybe answer questions, maybe pray for somebody, maybe have a prayer answered, but you prayed for somebody, and God begins to, to open them up. So consider, consider the challenge relationally, consider this challenge theologically, consider this challenge prayer, uh, uh, practically, listen to what they have to say, get to know their story, try to understand where they're coming from, but also, Consider this challenge prayerfully. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 4, and this dawned on me, this is not really about prayer, but this dawned on me one day as I was reading this. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul writes this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. The God of this world is the devil, and he has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers so they can't see the light of the glory of God in the image of Christ. So it's a supernatural problem here. The devil has supernaturally blinded and blocked the, the understanding of the gospel to people. That's a supernatural, a dark supernatural thing that has happened. Larry Crabb said once, you know, if we're looking for... <laughs> supernatural results we need to use supernatural means Larry Crabb is a Christian counselor <clears throat> so if there's supernatural spiritual darkness that is blinding the eyes of unbelievers then we need to implement supernatural means whereby to break that blindness prayer this is not about prayer but it is about the need for prayer for people whose eyes are blind. We never do this. 
Just as not in the Bible, I'm done with you. Shake the dust off my feet, some people say. No, I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I believe the Bible teaches that we pray for people, share with people, love people, and continue to endure and attempt to minister to them until one day the Lord may be pleased to open, open their hearts. Practice supernatural ministry. This is the last one. Practice supernatural ministry, which is prayer. It is prayer. So blindness, spiritual blindness is supernatural. Gospel ministry is supernatural. Praying is crucial supernatural work to accomplish the work that God has called each of us to. Holy Fathers, we come to you in Jesus' name today, Lord. What, a, what an awesome lesson that you've given us, that I got this week, Lord, that you've given me through this. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to be ministers who minister as is appropriate from Scripture, as you command us to, to treat others the way we would want to be treated to fight for these relationships, to love people, to listen to them, to pray for them. Lord, to, 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 to want to know their background, what, what has brought them to this point. Lord, I pray you'd help us to love others as Jesus loved Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem. Lord, I pray you would just put that love in our hearts for the people who are still outside of your family, but we care about they're part of our family or they're part of our close friends. And Lord, we're concerned that we know what will happen if they die and they've never trusted in Jesus. Lord, they'll spend eternity paying for their own sins. So Lord, help us. Help us to minister in a way that would make others more receptive. Help us to demonstrate your love and your compassion to those whom you have died for. Help us to be kind and respectful to those whom the Holy Spirit is in the process of drawing and wooing to yourself, Lord. Open our eyes to see. Open our will that we would be willing to do and to minister in a manner that you've called us to, Lord. Help us not to help us not to feel like it's weak to be like Jesus. And we'll ask you for that, Lord, in Christ's name today. Amen. sometimes it gets difficult to talk to people about the Lord, doesn't it? They don't want to hear it seems. But like Pastor said, we don't dare stop. God gives us the opportunity. We've got to let them know about the Lord. You know what? I've been praying for some of my unsaved loved ones that they're blind. They just plain don't see. Do you ever feel that way about some of those loved ones? I've been praying, Lord, open their eyes that they might see. We have a God that does miracles. And he can open blinded eyes of individuals if we'll just keep praying and bringing their name before the Lord. And I think there's coming a day when we get to heaven, and we're going to see some people there, and they're going to come up to you and say, thank you, I'm in heaven because of what you said. And you may never even know about it. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Let's stand together and sing it. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face. All
Thank you. 